We're running a little bit late, so we need to get things started for our uh, last session. So can everyone grab your seats, please? And just come on in. If you're, just come on in and grab your seats. A um, little bit of housekeeping business. Um, a few people were wondering, I, have been, I was asked the question, what's going on today after dinner? The timetable says dinner starts at 5.30, and then at 7.30 we have, the, we have Easter, Good Friday. At 7, sorry, at 7 is Good Friday. Now what that is, is that is we have a Good Friday meditation service, um, which you are all welcome to, to join and share in. It's going to be bilingual, it's going to be in English and in some form of Chinese, don't know which one. Um, but you're more than welcome to stay for that. So just to let you know, it's dinner at half five, but then the Good Friday service is 7 o'clock as well. Um, also, um, I'm going to ask Frappuccino and 7up if at the end of this session, um, you would just hang around and do a quick cleanup of things in here. So you are responsible for cleanup in here. So seven up and frappuccino, and I'm going to ask uh, oh, Coca-Cola do something. And Earl Grey tea, uh, if you can do the wash up of the tea cups that has that have been used. Okay, so Earl Grey tea, you are on the cleanup for the tea cups, and frappuccino seven up, you are uh, two in the hole. There's only, oh, there's only two people. Okay, uh, you can be joined. Well, actually, do you know what the washing up is? It doesn't. You, you can't fit that many people in the kitchen anyway. So, so Earl Grey Tea, ask for help. Okay. If Earl Grey Tea asks you for help, help them. It's the Christian thing to do. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everybody just before we uh, invite Pastor Enough to speak again, and we just want everyone to kind of stand up in their seats where they are, and just have a little bit of space around you. You need to have and. Uh, a little bit of space in front of you, a little bit of space beside you, and a little bit of space just all around you, okay? And what we just want to do is we want to make sure everyone is, it's, it's a long day, but make sure everyone's in the right frame of mind. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone, we're going to start down low, just at your toes. You don't have to touch your toes, this isn't a test, but we're just going to start low. And what we're going to do is, and wait, wait, don't start just yet, okay? I'm going to count us... Oh, to 20 as we do it, and we're going to start low at 20, at, at 1, and we're going to end at our tippy toes at 20, okay? So 20 seconds is actually a long amount of time, so we're going to do this slowly, okay? So you ready? So we're going to start down low, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, coming up slowly, Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. You see yourself stretching. Fourteen, fifteen. Hands are going up in there. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. At the tip of your toes. Okay, so stay up at the tip of your toes, and I'm going to bring you back down now. So twenty, nineteen, eighteen, seventeen. 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, and before you sit down, I say everyone take a deep breath in. Okay, Pastor Enoch, <laughs> we'd like to speak. Thank you. Wow, we should do that at church every Sunday. Thank you, Sam. Well, good afternoon. Getting some feedback from you that you wish you had more time to discuss. Getting some feedback from some of you saying, we're done early, can we go now? So, so it's a wide range of folks in this room um, and different places, so hopefully we can try to accommodate each other. Uh, I was telling Karen that I've actually never preached four talks in like, half a day. I'm actually thinking, I don't know how often you listen to four talks in half a day. Five if you count like some other things. So um, thank you for being here and your energy is good and that's how many of you feel. Um, <laughs> that's good. If you have a Bible, we're going to get our last talk that I have for tonight and I guess uh, later on we're going to have a good Friday service. Hope you can join us if that allows. I'm looking forward to meeting some folks from the Limerick uh, Church. Um, but we're going to turn to the New Testament book of James. The New Testament epistle of James. So this is more of a proper sermon. Um, I'm going to read the passage, 
uh, pray and then go through this, and then there'll be a time for you to have more discussion. I hope you're not sick of your group yet. If you are, just fake it, you know? It's, it's church. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just making sure your tea is kicked in. Okay, so uh, James chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 22 through 27, but we're going to focus more on verses 22 through 25. So I'll read verses 26 and 27 just for context because it flows through, but I really want to focus the time on verses 22 through 25. So let me read this for us, and then we'll open in prayer. So hear now the word of our Lord. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come. And maybe praying every time feels laborious or forced. But, Lord, I really believe and ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us and encourage us and challenge us, Lord. Give us the energy we need, not just to stay alert, but the spiritual receptivity to have soft hearts that would be moldable in your hands, O Lord. And I pray for the discussion, Lord. It is a lot to take in and discuss, but Lord, what an opportunity to spend so much time as a church family to really chat with each other, but also to go deeper with each other and maybe to learn about each other and encourage each other. So whether we're Christians or we're exploring Christianity, we're seeking or renew, we pray that you would help us to move further along. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, there are two kinds of people in the world, morning people and not morning people. And I say that because in the States, whenever someone says, I'm not a morning person, if they're in university or if they're working, I always point out, when you were in school or in high school, you had to wake up really early. And when you go to your job, you're going to have to wake up early too. So I think you just get used to that. I bring that because this passage in James talks about two kinds of people. When it comes to getting into God's word, there are really only two types of people. Uh, There's lots of ways to break this down, but there are two types. So this afternoon's message, there's three quick points I want to offer you from the text and then encourage you to go to discussion. First of all, what are the two kinds of people when it comes to the Bible? What are the two kinds of people that the Bible describes when it comes to God's word? What are the two kinds of people? Secondly, what's the difference between those two kinds of people? First, what are the two kinds of people when it comes to reading God's word or studying it or doing it? Secondly, what's the difference? And thirdly, how do, you, how do you pick which kind of person to become? How do you become the person that you want to be? Two types of people, what's the difference? How do we become the person that God wants us to be? So two types of people. We come here and we see this. There's really only two types. And you all, I all, we all fall into one of these groups. And so you see, that's not fair, Enoch. You're categorizing me. Well, really, the writer James, the brother of our Lord Jesus, he is categorizing you. So if you don't like it, again, that means we're actually listening to the Bible now. So chapter 1, verse 22, doers and hearers. Those are the only two types. Take a look. Verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Let me read that again. But be doers of the word, not only hearers only, deceiving yourself. There are only two kinds of people when it comes to God's word. There's only two kinds. There's someone that listens and hears it, and there's someone that listens and then does it. Basically, there's only two kinds of people after this conference. People that have heard it only, the people that will do it. There's only two kinds of students, there's only two kinds of men and women, there's only two kinds of people. You either are a hearer or you are a doer. Otherwise, it says in this verse, if you are someone who just hears it and doesn't do it, it says you are self-deceived. You are deceiving yourselves. In the States, one of the big things that is always a great source of humor and fun for me is um, uh, 
gym memberships. Gym is that thing you pay for that has all the um, equipment and exercise machines. So I go to a gym regularly. Uh, actually, it's called a Krav Maga studio. Krav Maga, does anyone know what that is? It's the, you know what it is? Can you show me? No, I'm just kidding. So Krav Maga is the fighting system for the Israeli Defense Forces. There's a military version, which involves firearms. I don't do that one. There's a civilian. It's, 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 it's basically street fighting. It's basically all about if you get assaulted on the street, here's what you do. Okay, so we do. So it's pretty, it's pretty intense workout. It's really fun. It's like playing video games with real people and bodies. That's really what I think about it. And so every January, I talk to my friend who's the instructor. We see the crush of people. And he kind of needs this. Because in the economy of a, running a gym or a studio, like a, you need people to sign up. So I was telling me, it's a January, right? Because after the holiday, you eat a lot of food, you make the New Year's resolution, I'm going to exercise, all that stuff. You go there, and you do that. And so you sign up for the gym membership. And I was asking him, well, all my life, I've been at gyms. And when I go to gyms, there's people that go in, and there's people that you know, do the machines, and they they look ripped. I mean, they're massive. They, they have all the muscles and stuff. And then there are people that go there, and I'm not trying to judge them, but you know, they get there and they come in there and they get on the bike and they kind of cycle for about two minutes. They go, oh, and get off the bike and they walk over here. It's like they're in a toy store. They pick up the weight and they kind of just do this for a couple times and, oh, and they put it down. And then they do all this stuff. And then inevitably, they go home and they think, I've worked out. <laughs> I've worked out. It doesn't work that way. If you go and just kind of like look at the weights, shiny, right? Or like, or like go to this machine, ooh, sticky, and you kind of do that. You're not really working out. You're kidding yourself. Or as some of my sons understand, I'll walk into their room where they're studying in our den, because their computer and their stuff is not in their bedroom. It's over in the study. And they go here, and I'm like, what are you doing? I'm studying. Oh, really? Why are you playing a game? My book is open, Baba. Oh, I see your book is open. What subject is it? And he's actually really good. He tells me the right subject. But basically, it's like, are you really studying or are you kidding yourself? Because just because your book is open does not mean you're studying, OK? It, I mean, have we learned that yet? Some of you are still, oh, no wonder. No, you don't get knowledge by having the book open. And we laugh about this, but here's really important. You can go to a great church on Sunday, have one of your deacons or your brothers or sisters or an elder give an incredibly encouraging word. You can be inspired. You can even feel these strong conviction or emotions, all those things. But you are a hearer. You are still in the category of hearer until after that, you actually, your life is changed in some tangible way. And this is important because James seems to think that all of us have a tendency to be deceived into just hearing. Just hearing. And not only that, who deceives us? We deceive ourselves, is what the text says. You, just think about this. Right now, you and I are predisposed in our human nature to believe after a great sermon or a great Bible study, you went to your small group and you had a great discussion you feel mm, closer to God, challenged, invigorated. You and I are inclined to be deceived that we're actually changing, that we're actually doing something. And I know I just spent the last session this morning, and even last night, talking about it's not just about doing, it's about why you're doing, it's not just about God's uh, blessing, it's about his presence, it's about knowing God. Yes, those are all important. But at some point, it's actually about doing it. And so we laugh, the person that says, you know, I only ate four slices of chocolate cake, I'm really cutting down. I only had four cups of tea, I'm really cutting down. You know, I'm going to church, but are you just hearing? Am I just hearing it? Now, this is an easy way for a pastor, especially a guest preacher, to tighten the screws of guilt on your soul. I can go, are you doing it? I can have this serious look. Are you doing it? And you go, no, pastor. Oh, beat me. Okay, just, you know, I'm not doing it. But we often get stuck there. And as I was talking to Elder Tommy and talking about how we could use this conference to really encourage the family here to think about that, 
Because it sounds like many people here, even if you're not a Christian, you probably have some sense that the Bible is important, that following Jesus' teaching is important. So we, many of us don't want to be just hearers. We want to be doers. How do we get ourselves to be undeceived? And there's actually a very simple principle here. Maybe you know it. If so, great. Maybe you've never quite heard it explained this way. And to that, I hope this will help you. Because the first point, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to Jesus' teaching, there's two types of people. Those who only hear it and those who are doers. They hear it and they do it. So what is the crucial difference? What do we need to understand? What do we need to know to actually understand the difference between a hearer and a doer? I'm going to say this principle, and then I'm going to show you from the text. Because according to this passage, there's only two things you can do with the biblical teaching. On the one hand, you can do it. Okay? You're thinking, great. And if you don't do it, you forget it. For any time Jesus teaches you something, there's only two things you can do with it. You do it or forget it. Those are the only two principles here. You do it or forget it. You read a great Christian book, you either do it or forget it. There's no do it and remember, but don't exactly do it that often. There's no do it, and then I'll do it when I have more discipline. Or I'll do it, but I'll do it when I'm less tired or less busy. You only have two options. Whenever someone comes and gives you teaching of God's word, or you come to the Bible, you must remember this. I will either do this, or I will forget it. There is no middle option. There's no middle ground. Would you see this now as it come to the text? Please take a look here as James describes this sort of funny picture of a man who looks in a mirror but forgets what he looks like. Let's pick it up in verse 22 because it's such a concise, short text. Verse 22, James writes, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he was like. In other words, friends, this is the basic idea. In the Bible, when it says, remember the word of the Lord, that's a common command. Psalm 78 is a great example. Psalm chapter 78, verse 7, the psalmist is calling the young, older to the younger generation, says, set apart their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep and remember the commandments. When they say don't forget the commandments, they don't mean, oh yeah, remember them in your head. When God says, don't forget the Ten Commandments, when God says, remember my commandments, when God, when he says remember, he doesn't mean make sure you can write it down from memory. When God says don't forget, he doesn't mean make sure you can get it right in the quiz. The Old Testament and the New Testament paint this contrast. Either you obey God's word or you forget it. There is no other option. And that is why it happens so much. This is something my senior pastor and I sometimes don't agree with. <gasps> Can I say that in a predominant Chinese church? So disrespectful. But the, the, here's, here's, and, and I see what his point is, and I think he understands. Here's the thing. We will talk and we'll say, in Boston, we need more Bible teaching. We just have such a low level of Bible knowledge. We need more Bible, more Sunday school classes, more teaching, more Bible study leaders. I agree completely. However, for some people, they don't need more Bible teaching. They need more Bible doing. I have heard way more sermons than I probably can apply. Even today, I'm probably making you hypocrites because I'm giving you four sermons. There's no way you, I mean, some of you are still thinking about doubting. And what does it mean to minister to my friend who's doubting? Or how do I love her? She's doubting. Or some of you are thinking, seek God's presence, not his blessing. I'm still stuck last night. It's not fair. We're moving on to the next topic. And that is why community, that is why this discussion time can be so valuable. That's why in our church, in the weekday small groups, there's two types. One type of small group can study a book or do their own thing. That's fine. They talk to us. They tell us this is the book we want to study, a Christian book or a book of the Bible. We work it out. We approve it. Fine. 
But most of the groups, all of our university small groups, and most of our young adult small groups, what they do is they restudy the passage we just preached on at the service. Again, that's not the only way. Why do I do that? Why do we do that? Because most of them probably, probably could use a little bit more time processing and thinking about it. The average good Christian in America is supposed to wake up on Sunday, read their Bible. So they got one Bible content. Then they go to worship service, another Bible content. Then they go to Sunday school, another Bible content. At the end of the day, they've had three Bible you know, messages to them. Can you really apply all that? If you're a more mature Christian, and a lot of this is a good reminder, or a lot of this is helping you sort of get it settled, that's fine. But if, if you're a brand new Christian, and every week you're hearing a new sermon, and every day you're reading the Bible, and you don't understand it, some of us, I'm not saying we need less Bible, but some of us, we just need more help in doing it. And that's something you have to work out with your church family. That's something you have to work out with your leaders, with your Bible study teachers, your elders, your pastors. There are only, there's only two things you can do with every sermon, every Bible study. Do it or forget it. On Sunday, I'm going to give you a preview. I'm preaching on failure. That is not a one sermon topic. If I really touch on failure, I'm going to open up emotional wounds. No, seriously. If I really talk about failure, you need time to admit that you struggle with that. You need time to think about forgiving those who feel, oh, that was so hard. A few weeks ago, I was speaking at this campus near Boston, and they, had me to, they invited me to speak on a topic in the end of their term, midterm examinations. So the person comes up and introduces me. This is Pastor Enoch from BCC. It's so great to have him. It's going to unwind after a whole week of classes and exams. Come and unwind because Pastor Enoch is going to share some encouragement from God's word. What, I don't understand why he said that. Because my topic was forgiveness. If I'm really going to open, if I'm really going to open the, the box of forgiveness, how will I not stir up the bitterness that we feel? How will I not be challenged to think of the people who really hurt us and we don't want to think about? How is it possible that I'll not feel totally guilty for the person who has not forgiven me? So many of our topics require more than one Sunday. Unless maybe we've all been Christians for so long, and right now everyone in this room has no one they need to forgive. But if you are struggling to forgive someone, you need more than a powerful sermon. The Holy Spirit has chosen to work not only through the proclamation of his word through preaching, but also through the mutual accountability of his word, through sharing, through praying, through laying on of hands. It's the whole deal, the whole church coming together. That is why we sometimes forget it. Because there's so much great teaching. I was looking at the notes in the back on the bullets on the left side. I'm sure you, actually some of you may never know that it was put there. I was list, reading the sermons the last few weeks, what I could in English and a few other things and stuff. I was really looking, looking for Tommy's sermon, but because... Uh, but, but basically, there's some great stuff there. But we need to know that it's not just hearing, it's doing. Because in the Bible, when it comes to God's word, there are only two types of people. Those that hear it only, and those that hear it and do it. You're only in one of those camps. The difference between the hearer and the doer is they remember this principle. Don't be like the person that goes in the mirror and looks at himself. I do this because I am fashion-wise, colorblind. Like, I'm not really colorblind, but I'm fashion-wise, colorblind. So Karen will, like, will see a color once, and four years later, remember that color. And then remember what clothing matches that. And I could stare at that and think, oh, this looks brown to me. She's like, no, it's white. And so I'm like, what? So I can't, and I, so I totally relate to the idea. If I look at it, I forget. I look at it, I forget. I look at it, I forget. I was getting the Wi-Fi password at Elder Tommy and Christina's home, which, by the way, I can give all of you if you want. <laughs> and I, it was so long, I had to take a picture of it, and I had to take a picture and enter it into my device so I can get on Wi-Fi because Jesus loves Wi-Fi. I was doing that, and I, I kept looking, wait, six, one, no, six, I, I just, and I think, I'm so dumb. I need to 
I need to slow down. I had to do this. I had to say, you know, A, B, C. A, B, C. D, E, that's not the password, by the way. <laughs> D, and I had to go really slow. I felt so frustrated. But I couldn't get the whole password down one time because I kept forgetting. That is why we deceive ourselves. Because we hear the word, sounds so powerful, so convicting. I want to do that. We could have more time discussing it. But then we go out, and our lives are so busy. Our schedules are so full. We have not made plans. One of the most powerful things I learned when it comes to pastoral counseling, or any counseling, is this. Before you leave my pastor's office, before you go and figure out to do, you have to figure out at least the beginning steps of a plan. And I will sit here and help you think about it. A couple just came to my house the night before we came. We weren't planning to see them, but someone shared they got a, a diagnosis of a lifelong disease, and there's some implications and things like that. So they shared, and we talked, and um, after talking, I shared, you know, this is what I hear. I told them it's very difficult, but I think all married couples will eventually go through this. And they felt so good. And the person, one of the couple, one of the members of the couple said, Pastor Enoch, it's just so good to know that we're not alone struggling with this. And I think if I closed in prayer, they would have been very happy and gone away happy. But I also believe that if I just closed in prayer then, they would have continued to have their conflict. Because feeling good for a moment doesn't change anything. Then I said, okay, the next time this, you have a fight, what are you going to do? And we spent the next like 45 minutes giving them a few things to actually work on. This is what we need. This is what is the difference between a hearer and a doer, because you either do it or you forget it. It is so easy to look in the mirror and then forget what you're wearing. It's so easy to think, to go, where are my glasses? Where are, I can't find my glasses. It's on your head. No, it's not. They go, oh, I mean, I know some of you have done that. Where are my glasses? Oh, here are my glasses. Where are my, you, you do that. Where's my contact? Oh, okay. Those things. We do that. And so, friends, sometimes you might be discouraged. I'm such a bad Christian. Part of it might be you're getting so much good teaching from your teachers here at this church that you just don't have enough time, enough community, enough energy to actually do it. Because remember this. When it comes to anything in the Bible, you're going to either do it or we will forget it. There is no middle ground. If you believe that, and if you are humble to realize, I'm going to, this is, you want to tell me the most discouraging thing to tell a preacher? I'm going to tell you right now. And you've said this. You're guilty. Maybe not to me. But this is the most discouraging thing for me. My church knows this. When I preach a sermon that they really liked, they tell me this. And they say, you know what I really despise? Is when I pour my heart in a sermon and I preach it and a brother or sister comes up, Pastor Enoch, that was a good reminder. I did not do all that to give you a reminder. You, that, that just crushes my soul. I want to see God change your life. I want to see it change. If you need a reminder, then clearly you're either doing it or you're not. And so now you're going to go, oh, don't tell Pastor Enoch is a good reminder because it makes me cry. They, you know, I don't want to remind. That's called, I want to say something nice to the pastor. I don't want to say it was boring because that sounds like unkind. What can I think of? Oh, Pastor Enoch, good Reminder, yeah, it's in the Bible. So, so you don't need reminders. You either need to do it or we will forget it. Two kinds of people in the world, according to the Bible, James says, hearers and doers. The difference is you either do it or you will forget it. You will be like a person who forgets and those sorts of things. So how do we actually become the kind of person that we, God wants us to be? Obviously, God wants us to not be hearers but doers. God doesn't want us to forget it. He wants us to do it. So how do we do this? We come to here in this last part, beginning now, take a look in verse 24 to 25. Verse 24 says this, picking it up in that story of the mirror, for he looks at himself in the mirror and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. That's the person when we forget. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. In other words, how do you actually become the kind of person that is a doer? The word there is persevere. You are called to persevere 
in the doing. Now, when I might persevere, I don't mean endure this incredibly difficult thing. Like, for example, I don't want to persevere my marriage. So how's your, how are you and Karen doing? We're persevering. God help us. <laughs> that sounds bad. That's what it sounds like when you have to sit through some teaching, isn't it? This is good for me. Preaching is like medicine, Chinese medicine. It's just you want to throw up, but it's good for you. You know, that's part of Sometimes it's like that. But it's, when they mean persevere, they don't mean it's so difficult. When they mean persevere, they mean continue. They mean don't give up. They mean continue even if it doesn't look like it's helping right away. Persevere through it. You think about that. The difference between a hearer and a doer is you have to do it or you forget it. And the way to do that is you keep doing it. I have this problem. And my kids have this problem. I tell my kids, one of the things, if you see me in my house, and I say this here because you may never meet them in this, you know, in this country. If you come to Boston, then okay. But one of the most common things Karen and I will say to the boys is this. Posture. Watch your posture. Texting, and I'm not calling any of you sinners, but so many people text like this. You ever watch Sherlock? You guys see that BBC thing? Okay. You know what actors do when they text? They text with beautiful posture because they're good-looking people. And they always text like this. Now, this is odd, but this is actually good posture. I'm always telling them posture. So here's the thing. My kids are generally obedient. Posture? Posture? You know, after that, the computer, throw on the phone. But just watch them. I can watch posture and watch 10 seconds later. <laughs> posture? So... I want them to hear my voice for the rest of their life. Posture. It's better for you. Because that's really what we need. They have to persevere. And the challenge is this. It's sort of like eating a food, eating meal, eating a meal or food. You may not remember every meal you've eaten, every meal someone's cooked for you, your parents made for you. But you know it's making a difference. Why? Because you're alive. And if you're young, you've grown up. And this is what I tell myself as a preacher. You probably won't remember all my sermons. I don't even remember all my sermons. But hopefully, by the grace of God, the word of God, which was a meal prepared for his people, gave enough encouragement and gave enough nourishment to sustain people. Sometimes the key difference is just persevere. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it when someone tells you that. To do the Bible, to keep doing that. Now, let's take an example of a school and teacher, of a teacher and a student. Let's say the student fails, OK? There's only two reasons a student can fail. The teacher is bad, or the student is bad, or both, OK? But basically that. Now, if the student fails, you think, wow, that's, I must be a bad student. But if you persevere, and you have 10 years of data to look at this teacher, and for all 10 years, this teacher failed half the class, maybe it's not the student. It's the teacher. Our middle son and our youngest son take the standardized exam for Massachusetts, the state. Standardized exam that all children have to take. My youngest one got his results. They were very good. In other words, as Chinese parents, I thought, not bad. So he did that. My second son, all my sons are hilarious and funny. My second son sees his score. It was not nearly as high. And he was looking at his younger brother, whose scores were at the very top of his entire, across the whole state. My, younger, my middle son, he was still in the top, but not as high. I was beginning to feel bad for my, my middle son, because I thought, oh, I hope he doesn't compare. I hope he knows we love him. I hope he knows his grade is hard. All these things, because I don't want him to get too depressed by this. Because he's seeing his son's, his brother's, little brother's really good score. He's seeing his lower score. And I'm about to encourage him. I'm about to say, don't worry, it's OK, where he says this, hmm, my score is lower than his. My teacher did a bad job teaching me. Maybe, <laughs> or maybe you, but we won't know until you persevere. If you teach children in Sunday school, are you going to determine if you're a good teacher by one lesson? What if I had one chance to observe you teach children in church, and after that I decide if you're a good or bad teacher? You know how depressed you'd be? Because they're not listening to you. They're crawling, they're punching each other, they're walking away, they're barfing, they're doing all these things with that. 
There's no way you could know. That is actually what it means to build your foundation on the word of Jesus. This is an encouragement. In other words, I love what Oswald Chambers said in our devotional and some of the questions. Every time you go to God's word, expect him to reveal something to you. But if you actually read the biographies of people like Oswald Chambers, you know what they'll say? 90 times out of 100, I go to the Bible, and I read it, and I feel nothing. The most famous men and women of Christianity, if you read their journals, their biographies about their devotional life, they go stretches, weeks, months, years, sometimes feeling like the, the Bible feels so dry. And of course, by the way, if you read someone's biography, and it has this incredible devotional, there's a reason why that devotional survived 500 years, and you're reading it. It's the good stuff. But what didn't survive 500 years is all the days they were so dry. And the Bible is so hard. It's not necessarily the right expectation that every time you come to the Bible, you're going to float in the air. And like angels, oh, like light will come down your head. Maybe, maybe, possible, be open to it, but also be open to the fact that this, like anything else, is the long road is persevere. Encourage to be persevering through that. Because if you persevere, you will not forget it. Instead, you will do it. And if you end up doing it, then we will break free of deceiving ourselves and thinking we're actually hearing it only. That's my great prayer for us here this afternoon. As we go into Good Friday evening, as we reflect on the meaning of Christ dying on the cross for us. Because Jesus didn't just say it. Jesus actually did it. Jesus had all the opportunities. to. They did not expect the Messiah to die a humiliating, naked death on the cross. But Jesus said, not by will, but yours be done. I will do it, Father. He did it for us. And because Jesus can do it, and Jesus persevered, if you think, I don't know if I can read the Bible every day, if I were to ask you to raise your hand, don't have to, but if I were to say, raise your hand if you at one point said, I'm going to read the Bible every day from now on. And then failed. Oh, you're raising your hand. Thank you. I didn't ask you. That's great. Thank you, Elder. <laughs> the next day. That's, that's what I was going to say. It, it's, it's discouraging. It's hard. But it's not based on your willpower. It's not based on your time management. It's based on Jesus working in you. But if you don't believe that he is working or going to work, you will give up. And Jesus wants to show you that if you persevere, you will not forget it. You will do it, and you will be a doer of the word. And that's why the example at the end, he talks about this is the ministry Jesus loves, visiting orphans and widows, people who are oppressed and looked down by society, and controlling your tongue. That is a constant doing that needs all the time, especially those who teach. But my friends, when it comes to wrapping up this afternoon session of getting into God's word, here's what we must remember. It's about building your life on Jesus' teaching, not just obeying it blindly. It's about building your life so that when your life has a horrible event, storm comes, you see what it's actually built upon. Let me close with a story of uh, our senior pastor, a wonderful godly man. His name is Stephen, his wife's Nancy, and their son, Matthew. Matt, uh, and they've shared this testimony uh, in our church. Matt is a great godly guy. Um, after his university days at University of Austin, Texas, he would you know, study there and work there for a number of years, serving bivocationally in a church plant. Exciting guy, great guy. Goes into the ministry and meets a wonderful woman who serves on this ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ, or Crew now. So it's a really great organization. So he ends up going to seminary, comes to California. They get married. She goes to California to study a degree in Christian counseling at a, at a well-known seminary out there. And then after they both finish their degrees, they come to Massachusetts because he's gonna just, they're going to see what the Lord has next. She's here for her medical, her internship. But basically when they move here, he, finds, he realizes that she's been distant towards him. She's been sort of keeping at a distance. He thought maybe it's moving back to Boston, his, his hometown, and maybe she just fell out of it. But it wasn't until like a, couple, like a year or two later, just she stopped going to church, she got really depressed. And this is, again, public. He shared this actually on this passage of the storms of life earlier we did this morning. And the whole idea is what he came to this. He learned, so he married a person who was in Christian ministry. He's in ministry. And this is what she told him eventually, finally, why they have this distance. When they were visiting back in Texas, she experienced same-sex attraction. Okay, she's married to him. 
And not only that, and there's more that I don't have time to explain, but that lingered, that thought, so it kind of did a, a major job on you know, her understanding of who she was and everything, and she was in counseling, all those sorts of things. Long story short, here's a guy that married a woman who was in ministry and went to seminary and got a degree, advanced degree in counseling for ministry. She ends up divorcing him because she basically is not sure of her sexual orientation. And in that context... He said, you just never know what your life is based on until the storms come. And only then can you really see if you persevered. So you know what the most touching thing is that the, the woman, the wife, the ex-wife, still loves the parents. She said to them, the hardest thing is that my in-laws, the senior pastor and his wife, they've only been kind to me. They've only been gracious to me. They still invite me over for dinner. And actually, that was really hard for her to handle. But the basic notion was, as they persevered in teaching God's word, and they're still praying for her, and I just pray for this, uh, this wonderful, precious person. But this is what it means. Where is your life built on? Are you getting into God's word? And you're not just hearing more sermons. I told my church last week that I'm not going to be here for Easter and Good Friday and baptism. And they looked at me like, what? How dare you, pastor? No, they didn't. <laughs> but they didn't. But I said, in the same sentence, I said, I'll be going to Dublin, Ireland. And now they're going, okay, now I hate you because Ireland's beautiful. And I said, and, you know, they're having me speak ten times. And they go, oh, okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> you won't have any fun there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and, 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 and that's what the call is. I'm, you have to listen to me ten times. God have mercy on you. You have to listen to me ten times. God needs to have mercy on you. Not because you have to suffer my teaching, mainly, but because can you really apply Ten sermons worth of material. So I'm not even going to set you up. As we go into discussion now, and really for the rest of this time, and even the conference, God may be speaking to you on one topic more than others. And I think your leaders, your facilitators, and this is the great thing about this conference, there are people here um, just speak into each other's lives and encourage each other. God might be calling you to persevere in some aspect of obeying Jesus right now. Maybe it's obey in your marriage. I know your marriage is horrible. Maybe your marriage is struggling. No one knows. But God may be telling you to persevere in it. And as you persevere, you might see his work. God may be calling you to persevere in some sort of sexual purity. God may be calling you to persevere in pursuing justice. Whatever it is right now in this discussion, God may be challenging you to be a doer. You don't need another reminder. You might need encouragement. You might need to know someone is praying for you. You might need to know that God is for you, not against you. You might need to know that God has made you more than conquerors through him. You might need to know that God can forgive you again because God wasn't surprised by your sin because he knew you and I would do that. You might need those things to move us to persevere, to be doers of God's word. And again, as we go into tonight and as we go to this rest of this conference, God may be speaking on one of these topics, so many topics. May he encourage you to really continue to get into God's word. Tomorrow morning, Lord willing, we'll begin to talk about getting God's word into us. We'll spend a little bit of time on that. But for now, I'm going to invite you again to, if you're still awake, to turn to your group and spend the rest of this time going over some of the questions. But let me, let me point out the questions next. How much of our Bible intake, whether you're reading it, you're teaching it, or studying focuses not just on hearing, but also doing God's word. This is not a license to critique all the teachers in the church. This is not a time to vent on, oh, so-and-so teacher is so boring. It's just Bible commentary and history. This is not about that. This is about we as a church family. How do we together kind of do that and think about, do we actually focus on applying, not just knowing? Secondly, I would love for you to share this if you are open to. Have you ever felt like giving up on regular Bible reading? Of course, if you're new to Christianity, maybe you haven't started this yet. Letting you know, very few people decide once, I'm going to read the Bible every day and then do it for the rest of their lives. Okay? They're called legends. Okay? <laughs> or, or Koreans. Or something, but, but, uh, but, and they're praying at 5 in the morning. But, but basically, if you have been in the Christian context at some point, have you been discouraged? You made a commitment at some conference. The pastor said, who's going to read the Bible every day? I will. I'm crying. Yes. 
and then the next week you just cry. So you need to know you're not alone and just encourage each other. And then thirdly, what are some of the practices here in Ireland, here in Dublin, that you have found, or in Limerick, sorry, uh, helpful to spend regular time in reading, reflecting, and doing Jesus' teaching? Mothers of newborns often get together and say, where in the world do you find time? People who are pulling down two jobs, ask us, people who are in rigorous academic programs, people who are in, in secondary school, is that what you call high school? Okay, no, for you. Secondary school, like the pressure to get into university, where do you get the time? How do you encourage each other? How do you do that with sports and other commitments? And sometimes you just need to get around with people who are going through similar things and encourage each other. Sometimes you need to get around people who've gone ahead of us, who have more experience, and just ask them. And some people look, I judge that person because when they had a baby, they stopped serving in church. They got too busy. I'm not going to do that when I have a baby. Well, guess what? Maybe it's not as easy as you think. And so this question, so as a church family, go ahead now, and we'll call you back for our break when it's time. So turn to your groups, please. Have a great discussion. So leaders, I've been told you can go to about 15 of, so 20 minutes. So I'll give you a five-minute warning. So it'll go by fast. So just be ready. Have a great discussion. So 20 minutes. Again, uh, don't mean to interrupt you if you're going. Apologize for that. Uh, some groups are probably could go longer. Some groups are done. But it's time to wrap up. So we'll close in prayer. And I'm going to just look at Sam. You're going to come up and give us some instructions after? OK, so stay seated after we pray. Sam will give us some instructions. And then I guess if you want to keep talking at that time, that might be appropriate. So let me pray for us. Father, thank you for bringing us to this day. Thank you for your great love and provision. Because Lord, you have things planned for us individually and as a church family. You desire that we would grow deeper in you and your word and to know you more personal. Lord, the best of your blessings is nothing compared to your presence. So help us to understand that. Um, some folks are just coming in now or coming in tonight. Some folks uh, are just coming in today after a week of work when we've been here maybe a day and a half or so. So help us to kind of get back and catch up with them to the real world because you call us not just to be gathered here as a community, but to then be scattered out into the world to be your salt and light and hope. So thank you for the great love you've given to us. Help us to be worshipful, grateful, and reflective of everything that Good Friday means for the world and for us. We love you and give you this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sam.
Um, yep, there's not much to say other than um, we're, we'll, we're going to, uh, just a reminder, if you're cleaning up the, just when you leave here, uh, take your stuff with you. Well, I think we're, we're having the East Good Friday service in here, but we can just turn our chairs and fix them up so they're facing the stage again. Um, again, we're going to, dinner's the same as before, and what was it, just tidy up stuff? Uh, was there anything else? The service starts at seven in in here, so we just invite you to be to come prompt, um, and that's really it. Yeah, so that that was kind of it. Just if we can leave the place tidy and oh, and also yeah, make sure when you're leaving today, make sure you leave your name tag back at the desk as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>